Hello everyone, my name is Oliver Empton. I'm your host today. I'm the CEO of Silktide and we'll be talking about how AI is transforming web design. Now, I'm going to begin with a quick demonstration. So this demonstration is brought to you entirely by generative AI. In fact, the following took under five minutes for me to create and I wasn't really trying that hard to be that quick about it. But to show you this, I need to explain a little bit of backstory. So firstly, this is Bloom. Bloom is an entirely fictional organization that specializes in selling indoor plants. So I want you to imagine the kind of uh, company that sells designer plants to people with too much money and not enough time. Now, that's my business idea. Let's pretend I need a website. Let's pretend I'm gonna ask AI to help me out. So I spent all of a few minutes and I was able to pull together a design like this. In fact, that's pretty much my, my second attempt. Spent a little bit more time, I got one like this, a bit more rustic. A little bit more time, got one like this. This I really like. Maybe it's not that practical, but it's certainly visually impressive. And again, so far I've spent under five minutes. Now, the thing is, if you spend any time with generative AI or recent modern AI advanced tools, it's pretty much impossible to escape the realization that it seems to challenge what we're actually doing on a fundamental level. The question you might well ask yourself is how much web design will AI do for us? That's one of the main questions we're going to answer today. But there'll be many more besides. To get us started, let me show you what we're going to cover. Firstly, what goes in? To web design. Hopefully everyone on this call is familiar, but we're still going to take uh, a first principles approach and break it down. We're then going to look at the state of AI today, specifically with regard to web design. And lastly, we're going to talk about how to predict AI in two to 20 years. And if that sounds absurd, you should stick around because it is, but it's also quite a lot of fun. Right. So firstly, Let's take a look at what goes into web design. Now, you can cut this up any which way you want. Uh, you could look at roles, you could look at tools, you could look at responsibilities. I took a relatively simple approach looking at six main areas of almost intellectual responsibility, skills, if you will. Um, and you'll see why, because what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these six and we're going to dive into them from the perspective of generative AI. So to begin, let's look at understanding. So understanding a website, is a core competency, even if it's not a specific role. Um, managers of a website project, for example, may be responsible, they may be creative directors. To be honest, some level of understanding is uh, present usually in everyone working on a web design project. And the typical areas that this results in are a requirements, specification, document, understanding, maybe just a load of messages passed around on Slack, but something about requirements and something about your audience which most commonly is represented as personas. Next up is messaging. So messaging can often be thought of as copywriting, but I think it's actually deeper than that. This is where you actually try to figure out what specifically are you going to say and how are you going to say it in a way that's compelling to your audience. Um, it's the difference between just saying, you know, directly uh, stating out the point of your business and actually getting into the head of your customer and writing something for them that unlocks the, the desire and the excitement and the intrigue in your prospective audience. Next up is architecture, which is just, I had to make it one word, but it's informational architecture. It's essentially the structure of your site. It's the planning of the navigation, the uh, content on the page, prototyping, etc. Then we get to design. Of course, what many people think of as core web design, but it's just a visual component. So visual design is making it look great. But then you also have the user experience component, which is generating a great experience for a user. And that encompasses a whole range of other things, including like how efficient the content is or the, the design is, as well as how accessible it is. Next up, media. Now, anyone who's already uh, been on the internet for the last year has probably come across the application of AI to this. We'll take a little more of a detailed look later on, but typically uh, websites are gonna use some forms of illustration or uh, fonts or icons or photography, often a combination of all. So we'll take a look at those. And then lastly, we have testing. Testing, we're looking at 
things like, well, running it on real users, actually taking your prototypes, potentially your low fidelity prototypes, wireframes, et cetera, and just running them in front of real people and saying, hey, can you make sense of this? And then interpreting all of that and turning it into useful insights that can improve the quality of your website. That's the theory. Of course, we all know not every web design team necessarily does all of these things, certainly not perhaps as much as they'd like, but this is the kind of ideal framework. So let's dive into the first one, understanding. Okay, so AI understanding a website, how would that even work? Well, I'm gonna start you off with a tool you probably haven't heard of called QOQO. And uh, you may well be wondering how do you pronounce that? And I honestly, I have to tell you, I haven't got a clue, no idea. Uh, <laughs> you'll see there's quite a few AI companies out there and they all seem to have quite terrible names. But anyway, QOQO specialize in generating user personas with AI. So you can type in something as simple as a 35 year old payroll manager, and they will actually attempt to generate a complete user persona from just that description. Generally, you want to give it a better one. This is incidentally a Figma plugin. So if you use Figma, uh, you can check it out for free. It's pretty cool. It's like a couple day free trial or something, but yeah, no, no affiliation. I just, I've used it and I thought it's pretty useful. Um, so in this example, I'm going to take our Bloom website and I'm going to give it a persona of a young, busy professional looking to decorate their apartment with lots of plants. They're affluent and well-educated. And I ask for a persona card and I get something like this. Now, if you actually stop to read this, it's kind of impressive. Um, take a look at some of the needs of this person. Um, they want clear and concise information on plant care and maintenance. They want guides on proper watering techniques, recommendations for low light indoor plants, um, tips for preventing and dealing with common pests in indoor plants, etc. Um, this is actually legit. It's um, surprisingly insightful, especially given the brevity of my description. And this goes on beyond the one page you're seeing here. There's actually like a, way more content below the fold that I'm not showing you. So that was pretty handy. Um, and it took me about a minute. So if I'm trying to get ideas for like my content calendar or my website structure, this was a genuinely useful kicking off point. Now, you maybe aren't using QOQO. Uh, maybe you're using, say, in this case, I'm using ChatGPT. You can still do something very similar. And I'm going to show you the contrast between the two because it's quite informative. So imagine I just type in a prompt like this. I'm starting a business called Bloom, which delivers indoor plants that are easy to take care of. Help me create some user personas. And sure enough, it does that. It comes up with about six. This is uh, the first one, which is my favorite, eco-friendly Emma. And uh, it's even given it a fun funky name, which I quite like. Um, bit of alliteration is always good. And it's a very, very lightweight user persona in this case, right? It's not really what I want. I want to get a bit more detail. So um, this is one of the things you're going to start to see. You'll see that the first tool was a very specialized AI product that was designed for a specific use case. And it does a very good job at it with minimal effort. Here, I'm using a general purpose AI tool GPT, which I suspect, hopefully, 90% of the people on this call have actually used, or one of the, uh, the equivalents, like, say, Claude or uh, Bard. But a general purpose tool can perform much the same task, but you'd have to put a lot more effort in. You'd have to sit here and kind of uh, nudge it in the right directions. But anyway, um, let's say I like this eco-friendly Emma. Great. I want a persona around that. I actually think, you know what? It'd be quite fun to have a cartoon of eco-friendly Emma. That would look good. So let's get a cartoon. There we go. Took me about 30 seconds. So I take my cartoon and then I copy that onto, I, I copy that into Word and I pasted the, uh, the persona that it gave me uh, with one extra prompt. And there in about two minutes, I've now got a reasonably decent user persona for almost no work whatsoever. And this is actually useful in driving understanding, shared understanding of this website. I can share these personas as you should be doing with your staff and uh, hopefully align people around a better understanding of your audience and what they can do. Crucially, you can also share that, of course, with your other AIs, but we'll get to that. So um, again, to look at what we have here, this is a user persona generated for a general purpose tool and a little bit of manual work. And this is the persona that was generated by a specialized tool. And to be honest, the specialized tool did a better job. It came up with more genuinely valuable insights and it was quicker, but of course you have to pay for it. So you'll find that there'll be this divide between using specialized and generalized tools. I suspect everyone's gonna have a generalized AI and a handful of people will have specialized AIs for their specific roles. 
So let's move on to messaging. So messaging, uh, to recap, we're looking at things like the uh, the ways that you specifically explain, communicate your, your product, your benefits, your services. Um, so in this case, I might ask GPT, hey, can you write 10 three-word slogans for this business? And literally off the bat, it came up with nature, comma, delivered, which I love. Uh, green dreams delivered, uh, fresh foliage straight to your door, uh, blossom your space from soil to sanctuary. Not sure I like that, but it's certainly creative. Uh, nurture nature indoors. Again, that's kind of maybe a little too clever for its own good, but it's pretty cool. These are impressive, right? These are objectively impressive. I'm, they're not going to win a Pulitzer Prize, but if you're not getting value out of this, you're probably not looking closely enough. These are hard for people to do. Um, most human copywriters are not this effective or nearly as fast. So I took Nature Delivered, which I liked, and I stuck it on this web design, which took me, again, another sentence or two of text. And there you go. I've got a concept early on of something to think about, to spin uh, ideas around that took me almost no time whatsoever. I could follow up. I could say, all right, can you identify some key messages that would resonate with Emma's user persona? The persona I had earlier on, feed that back in, right? It's your briefing document to staff. It's also your briefing document to AI. Uh, think of it as like onboarding your AI, which is a terrifying and brilliant new reality we now live in. Um, so having onboarded your AI with Emma's user persona, can it give you a heading and a single sentence of text copy for each? Let's take this key messages. So for Emma being eco-conscious, uh, uh, it suggests something like green living made simple or eco-friendly always, or breathe easy with air purifying plants. These aren't terrible. They came up with a whole bunch more, but let's just take the first one. Green Living Made Simple, put it on a web page that it designed. You can sort of get a feel for what that might look like. Now, again, I wouldn't use that design, but it took me minutes, literally minutes, to ideate like this. Let's move on a bit. Architecture. So um, informational architecture in this case, not actually to be confused with any building construction. Um, the informational architecture typically is like the, the pages that you'll have uh, the structure of those pages, the naming of those pages, the sort of things like uh, the tags or whatever, if you have search, et cetera, all that kind of stuff, as well as like what you put in those pages, like what kind of structure you put. Now, for this, I want to show you another tool, AI tool, called UI Zard. And yes, this continues the uh, long running trend of terribly named AI products. Um, seriously, what are these guys doing? They literally have access to AI to name their products. I don't know. But anyway, I genuinely do not know how to pronounce this name. UIZARD, QO, QO, whatever, anyway. Um, but it's it's pretty cool. And you can use what I'm going to show you here for free. So I, again, no affiliation. I just encourage you to check them out. It's kind of worth it for a, for a play. Um, what they do, they do a design tool that's a little bit like Figma. The design aspect isn't nearly as good as Figma, but the AI bit is pretty impressive and it's worth playing with. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use their uh, auto designer and I'm just going to give it a brief. And my brief is four words. I say bloom plant delivery business. That's it. I was very, very lazy. And then I just told it green, verdant, contemporary for qualities. That's all I did, right? Really, really basic. And I told it I want a web page or website and it goes ahead and it puts together some sketches for pages. Now, these are not going to win design awards. They are not, you know, spectacularly beautiful or anything at all. But I want I encourage you to look at the structure and the kind of the copy and so on. And it's kind of thrown together as a starting point and consider what it's actually doing to pull this off. So it's got to discover a wide variety of plants for your home. Maybe not necessarily the copy you want to lead with, but it came up with something that's technically valid. Put a search box under it, search for plants, browse by plant type, care level. Uh, you've got categories in there, indoor, outdoor, flowering, succulents, herbs, ferns. I mean, I'm not an expert on plants, but that seems legit to me. And it's a pretty decent starting point. If I didn't know plants, the first thing I'd probably do is try and learn enough about it to figure out categories and uh, logical sections to, to work with. It's done it for me. Um, and it's just put them together on a web page design. I mean, again, the design isn't beautiful, but look here, this is a search box, right? So... It's got recommendations at the top with some appropriate image. Well, maybe not totally appropriate imagery. I think the fourth one is of a cloud, but still it's trying. And it's got some tags, uh, pet friendly, easy care, uh, recently viewed plants. That's actually legit functionality that I may not have thought of to include. And it's, yeah, it's done it all for me. Literally, literally 
from a four word brief. There aren't many humans that can pull that off quite so effectively. Right, moving on. Um, we also see a shopping cart here. It's actually, it's actually designed a complete shopping cart for us, which I'm not going to show you, but it's kind of impressive that it's even capable of analyzing what you've got, speculating on pricing and, and categories and so on for your products and putting it all together. And I can iterate on this. I can go into a chat box and I can say, hey, can you have a landing page which sells our most popular cacti and generate that? And sure enough, it comes up with an extra page, which is so long I can't show you the whole thing. But again, this is not perfect. You're not, you're not gonna publish this on the internet. But as a starting point for a conversation, it's reasonably insightful and there's some value in it. And it's not hard to imagine how a product or a tool like this can become far, far more capable in the near future because none of this stuff existed less than 12 months ago. Moving on to design. So at the start of this, I gave you a quick demonstration and I'm gonna go back to that. The demonstration I gave you was I asked ChatGPT4, which has an AI uh, image generator known as DALI3. Um, I asked it to draw the homepage of a plant to the delivery business called Blue. And I literally gave it this short two sentence brief. That was it. And it came back from that and it gave me this, which I wouldn't go live with. And it's got some obvious flaws, but still it's a start for a conversation. And then I asked it again and gave it some more refinement. I was like, can you make it more colorful, for example? So it came back with this. Um, and I continued along in this line. So it's not difficult. You just type in what you want and it comes back. And so I wanted a more rustic style. Now, do I actually want a more rustic style? I don't know. At this early stage, I'm literally trying to feel out what I think works best. So I might say, for example, do a crazy artistic one, do a really old fashioned stylized one. I might ask for one that looks like a Salvador Dali painting because that just hits me in the moment, right? You have all sorts of options here. And this is really, really powerful, but it also reveals a range of strengths and weaknesses of this kind of technology and this kind of approach. So it's really impressively creative, to be honest. I think we like to deride AI as like, oh, it's derivative and, and whatever. But the truth is, if you had a human who did all three of those designs, especially if it did them in under five minutes flat, you'd be kind of impressed. Um, it's as creative as the prompts that you give it. But um it's surprisingly expressive within that and because it knows basically everything it can do any style you can choose to throw at it it's also unquestionably relatively appealing like it, you may not realize this but all of the image generators the major ones the mid journeys the dalis they're all trained on human uh taste on the human aesthetics so they've actually been given lots and lots of images that have been scored by people. And they've essentially tried to learn what people like to look at. Um, and for that reason, they tend to sometimes overplay doing a design that looks good, even if it doesn't quite deliver the qualities that you actually want. And of course, it's very, very fast. You can't really argue with, I got a design in 20 to 30 seconds. So it's a starting point, but it's definitely not something you could use as a real web page design. The main problem here in this specific tool chain is it's fixed. These are bitmaps and the, the tool that I'm using here has no ability to refine it. I can't go here and say, I like that design, but can you move the logo 10 pixels to the left? It literally can't. If you ask for it, it will just do a new design again, which is not really what you want. And in most cases, that alone is gonna kill stone dead, the idea of using this as a web design, but it's very useful as a form of inspiration. And you can take the components of these designs and pull them out. So you can say something like, I love that image in the middle. Can you generate an image like that, just the image? And then you can put that into your own design tool, for example. Um, it's inaccurate. So anyone who's played with these kind of tools knows this, but uh, you can ask for uh, something and it can outright reject everything that you're asking for. So in this case, the first design on the left gave me what I wanted, but then the, the second one, it put it inside a screenshot. So I don't, oh, sorry, I put it inside a, a monitor, right? I don't want it inside a monitor. I want it to just look like a screenshot. That's all I care about. Um, so I specifically said, could you not do that? Could you not put it in a computer? Can you just give me an image? And of course it came back with a third image that was exactly what I didn't ask for. This is a common experience and it is somewhat frustrating. And of course you can't help but notice that when it comes to text, image generators like this are kind of hit and miss. They've got better, they've got a long way to go. 
for lots of reasons, it's pretty hard to get right. Anyway, I also asked the same AI to help me generate some logos. And again, whilst these are not something you would commercially apply, they are kind of informative. Um, the one on the left, uh, I actually quite like the way it's joined the two O's into an infinity symbol. If I were designing my own logo, I might use that as inspiration. I'm less keen on the delivery being joined with a V and the E, but you can see what it's trying to do. It's trying to create like a pattern, right? Um, the design on the right is kind of accidentally hilarious. It's trying to loop in the L of bloom into the O, but it's accidentally ended up writing the word boom, which is perhaps not the connotation I want for my verdant plant company, but provocative nonetheless. Um, I played with this slightly longer, a couple more minutes, and I got this. And this, I actually quite like. It's not great, but as an inspiration, as a starting point, that's pretty reasonable. And historically, what I might have done is sketched on a pen and pad or just played around with clip art and Google for an hour or so. So this is a faster alternate, alternative and interactive way of exploring more ideas like that. Another thing you may not realize you can do with modern design tools is uh, expand your range of modality. And so what I mean by that is, let's say like me, you like to sketch on whiteboards or on pieces of paper. You can do that and then you can upload your design and you can give it to a tool like UIZard and it will turn your hand-drawn sketch on the left into a vector design like you see here on the right. This is kind of magic. Now, it's not a great interpretation of that design. It's very functional, but it's not very aesthetic. But nonetheless, it just saved me a whole ton of time. And you're going to see tools like this, Supercharged. I guarantee Photoshop, Illustrator, they all get the same tool. There's no way they won't. Um, both are leading in uh, AI advancements as of late. So um, this is the sort of thing that will progressively transform more and more of how we work and how efficiently we can work. Right, next up, media. So media covers things like photography, um, illustration, clip arts, logos, icons, etc. And it can't really have escaped anyone's attention that this has been turned upside down in the last year by things like Midjourney. This is Midjourney, which is probably the most skilled and capable image generation tool out there. Uh, what you may not be familiar with is what Midjourney's look like over the years. Um, the top left corner, that's the first version of Midjourney from February 2022. I encourage you to look at this. This was, in February 2022, this was state of the art. This was a revolution. No one had ever done anything like this before. Um, it's actually kind of crazy how transformative this was at the time. And then less than a year later, we had this. This is November the same year. So significantly improved, but still far from perfect. I mean, you know, pretty impressive. If a human artist had done that, you'd assume it took them quite a few hours. But, yeah, we could do it in 30, 60 seconds, something like that. Anyway, a year later from there, we're at this level. It's not hard to see the significant advance in quality um, and capability from these tools. But just to underscore it, I want to show you another example. This is, again, V1 of Midjourney, February 2022. These images are clearly far from ideal, but like, let's look less than a year later and we got to here. And then a year later from there, we're at this. And of course that's December, 2023, which in AI terms means a thousand years ago. So let's look at where we're at a month later. So this is where we are right now. This is Midjourney 6, the latest, latest version of Midjourney. And it's amazing. Um, it can do things like this. This is this looks like CGI, right? This is rent, this is done by a generative AI tool, which is absurd. Normally you'd need a 3D artist or something, but anyway, um, this one, frankly, is hard to believe it's computer generated. That is outrageous as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, honestly, if you didn't know, could you tell that wasn't a photo, really? What about this? This looks like hand-drawn art to me. I mean, consider the detailing, the, you know, uh, not just the, the the nuance of like the you know the reflection that's on the lighting on the jacket here and the rain, but also consider like the artistry uh, applied to generate something that creative and expressive and quite frankly beautiful. It's amazing, and now you can get it in thirty seconds by typing in a box. And of course, this stuff. All right, maybe you've seen it before, sure. But have you seen this? This is also Mid Journey Six. This, <laughs> this fools a lot of people. Um, it's hard to believe, but AI can generate pretty much anything at this time. And realistic looking old style photos is a genre and it's hauntingly good at them. None of these people even existed. Now to that end, 
there is a whole wealth of new and exciting specialized tools designed to help designers put together better things like web pages or graphic designs. And one of my favorites is this tool, Generated Humans. This tool essentially is a database of humans that they've generated entirely with AI that you can explore and download. And if you pay them a little bit of money, you can actually create and iterate yourself. So you can go in here and you can do things like, I wanna set my hair color, skin tone, emotion, everything you want. You can play around and drag and drop aspects of their face and generate literally any photo, any image that you like. You can even do it with a full body pose like this. Now, the potential applications to this are numerous, but one of the most obvious is that you can actually have uh, models essentially pose for you with any profile that you want, any type um, of, uh, you know, you can look at your user personas from earlier and ask the AI to take uh, some of your user personas and actually render them as prospective um, illustrations or uh, photos in your website, which is kind of crazy. And there's no licensing agreements. There's no concerns that, you know, you need a release or that anyone else can use the same clip art that you chose to use. So the practical applications of this are quite profound. Um, and tools like this were not even possible six, 12 months ago. And now there's tons springing up. So you can try this one for free. I recommend you check it out. Anyway, lastly, let's look at testing. Testing. So typically testing, uh, it seems like a pretty human orientated thing. The whole point is you've built out a web page or potentially just a prototype, a sketch, a wireframe, and you want to test it on real people. You want to understand that it works. You want to understand that people resonate with it. Maybe you've just come up with some messaging, you know, your, your core pitches and so on. You want to get that in front of users. Well, AI is actually affecting this in ways that may not be obvious. So there's a company I'm going to draw your <clears throat> attention to uh, called Attention Insight. And what they do is quite novel, quite specialized, is they have synthesized uh, the human behavior behind eye tracking. And so what they're able to do is they're able to create things like heat maps where they predict how users will interact with a design before the design is even live. So in this case, you're seeing this uh, web page on the left and on the right hand side, you're seeing a heat map for it. And the heat map is looking at things like the text. And in this case, it's paid particular attention to the woman's face on the, the bottom left. And it's derived this uh, through AI. AI essentially has trained on a lot of human behavior and has learned how to imitate it. And so if you're working on a design like this, you can get at a glance immediate assessment of how your users are likely to react to your design. Now, many of us have probably heard of uh, shifting left when it comes to the accessibility uh, community, the idea of uh, moving the accessibility uh, components of your production process further forward into the design process, essentially shifting them left in your timeline, if you will. Now, I suspect we're gonna see a similar transformation here with AI bringing forward aspects of user testing into the design process. We could literally be working on graphic designs, and as you're working on a graphic design of a web page, AI could be commenting in real time, could be highlighting in real time how it expects users to respond to the page that you are sketching right now. And similar tools could be integrated into CMSs, they could be integrated into all manner of, of tool chains. So we won't necessarily even need to wait to make something live in order to get feedback on it, which is kind of wild. Anyway, moving on, I want to show you something new and exciting from my own company, Silktide. We're launching a feature today uh, for our Silktide AI platform, which we call Improve UX. Now, Improve UX is leveraging AI to improve the user experience of your website. And it works really, really simply. It's literally a button. Um, let's say you're looking at this web page here in Siltoid right now. This is a fictional e-commerce website that sells wine. So the AI, you click the one button, takes a look at this page, and it slides in a panel like this. And it will assess what this page is actually trying to do. So it'll say, okay, uh, the goal appears to be showcasing a specific wine, emphasizing its quality and value. And another aim is to encourage visitors to make a purchase through a prominent call to action button. So correct, the AI has figured that out. It's also figured out the strengths. It determines that the contrast between the sale price and the original price is a good strategy to highlight the deal being offered. And that the use of an image of the wine bottle and glass helps to visually engage the user and showcase the product. So that's all good. But then it goes on for quite a while 
with improvements to consider, things that might make this page more effective. Um, it suggests more detailed product information, like uh, information about the wine's characteristics. And also it notes that the uh, video or audio player in the middle um, seems to be kind of dodgy because it says uh, it has a duration of naught minutes and naught seconds, which is actually smart enough to figure out not only exists, but is probably very inappropriate. So this is wild. This is modern AI for you. It's literally looking at your web page and performing an intelligent user experience critique of your visual design, which is wild. I know because I worked on this and I know that six months ago, none of this would even seem like, it would, to be honest, almost four months ago, this would have seemed like a dream. And now it's something that you know, we're able to experience today. It's wild. Anyway, um, you may have noticed there's a chat box in the bottom right-hand corner. And if you click in that and you want, you can have a conversation with that UX assistant. You can ask it for a lot of questions. So let's do that. I could ask, what would be a better order for the content on this page? It could tell us, well, I would put the product name and image first, and then I would follow it up with the pricing information. And then lastly, I'd have the call to action right below the pricing. So it's actually proposing reordering this. Right now it's got you know, the title, some text, some video player, the price, and then right at the bottom, it's got the, the buy now button. And I believe quite correctly, it's uh, assessing this and saying that's not a very good idea and you should, should do it better like this. Um, I could ask it for some more. I could say, could you write some better text for the buy button? And it says, well, replace get me now, which is terrible with ads to cart. And I could ask why that wording? Um, add to cart is a widely recognized and understood call to action that specifically indicates to users they'll be adding the product to their shopping cart. So it's important to realize here, and this is true of all the AI you've seen so far, is that at its best, AI is not just parroting copy and pasted points. It actually understands, like it has reasoning for the thing that it's advocating for, and it can justify it. And if you're not convinced, you can ask it. It's kind of crazy. Anyway, we're very uh, excited and proud to, to launch this feature. Um, this is free to all existing Silverfly customers, and it will be going live in a few hours after this webinar today. So all you need to do is view a page in the inspector and click on the Improved UX button at the top. So moving on, let's wrap up this section. So we've been looking at the state of AI today, so January 2024. And I have to add the January 2024 because this is AI. So by February 2024, everything will probably be different. But um, we can take a pretty good assessment of the kind of tools I've shown you and consider how they affect what goes into web design today. So if we look at this breakdown, the understanding, the messaging, the architecture, and so on, um, I've attempted to chart out how much AI, present day AI, is affecting or able to affect that area. Now, this is non-scientific, but I just want to kind of give you some kind of frame to work with. So the areas that I would consider the most impacted are messaging and media. So messaging is where you're looking at things like writing your copy, particularly your original ideas for copy, and media is things like illustration, photography, clip art, and so on. It's not hard to see why. ChatGPT takes care of messaging, or at least it doesn't take care of it, but it significantly accelerates your ability to perform in that area. And I've been writing copy for 20 odd years and love it, but I still wouldn't know how to tie my own shoelaces anymore without using GPT, because for me, it's just such a magnificent way of accelerating my creative process. I don't rely on what it gives me. A lot of the time I use what it gives me to reject the cliches, so I write something better, but it is incredibly impressive at getting you started. And likewise with media, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, stop using real photography, real clip art, real illustrations, but I can try stuff out in minutes or even in seconds with generative AI. And sometimes, yeah, the generative AI honestly is better. It's more custom. It's quicker. Uh, you'll certainly notice I've used plenty of it in this presentation today. Um, and then as we move down, requirements of personas, well, they're getting, you know, there's definitely an impact of AI there, but it's not going to uh, take over, but it's definitely making a big deal. And actually that's a key point to mention. When I say AI disruption here, I'm not talking about AI doing this job. That's a whole other story. I'm talking about AI changing the nature of this job, right? So like, imagine if you were a uh, writer and you didn't move from using yeah, pen and paper to a word processor at some point, you know, you might be left behind. Well, in the same way here, 
if you're working on copywriting and you're not using generative AI, you are probably going to be left behind. If you look at architecture, it's somewhere in the middle. There's tools to help with planning and prototyping, but they're relatively uh, early stage at this point. And then with things like visual design, UX design, and the user testing, there's relatively little. And at the moment, its ability to affect this specific uh, set of requirements is quite low. But I will expect that to improve. So when we asked the question earlier on, how much web design will AI do for us? Well, I guess, at least for the moment, even though we could produce designs like this, they're not actually that commercially applicable yet. This is great. This is beautiful. And it's uh, an intellectual curiosity, if nothing else. It certainly helps get me started. If I was doing real design, I might look at that and go, ooh, I had not thought of that. That's interesting. But then is this actually going to work as a real design? I mean, ignore the obvious flaws like the fact that the text is nonsense. Um, this doesn't necessarily commercially work for me. It doesn't necessarily sell the products in the way I'd actually want. Um, and it's certainly not something I can just lift into a design product like Figma and work with. Not yet. But it's a good start. AI right now is giving us superpowers. It's giving us new abilities to do things that we've already been doing, but faster and more capably and to a higher standard. But the thing with giving us superpowers is that with great superpowers comes great responsibility. So if you think about going from handwritten uh, pen and paper to a typewriter to a word processor, with each subsequent advance, we were expected to work faster or to make things better because the word processor lets you go back and edit or, you know, uh, even a typewriter just lets you write quicker than you could with a uh, pen and paper. But of course, it also comes with the expectation that you're going to have to know more. Um, each subsequent technical revolution introduces a new set of skills. And in this case, it'll be the skill of understanding and effectively applying AI. And that is going to transform huge aspects of what we do. It's worth thinking of it, I think, as a way like this diagram shows you, as you are in charge almost of a little robot army. You are all going to become a director, a creative director, if you will, or a, uh, a leader, a CEO, if you will, of potentially a countless array of AIs. And it's up to you to be a good boss to them. Properly instructed, they'll transform your potential. But uh, improperly instructed, it'll be like uh, being a bad boss to people. You won't get what you want at all. So as we uh, move into the final section of today's presentation, let's take a look at something a little wilder and a little more speculative. We've looked at AI as it currently exists within the web design industry, but I wanna take a look at predicting AI two to 20 years in the future. Now this may be something of a fool's errand. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm setting myself up here to put this on YouTube so that someone can come back in 20 years and laugh at me. Um, but I have, thought about it at considerable length and this is uh, something I've been following for over well almost 30 years at this point um, so let's take a shot at it let's look at seven AI breakthroughs that you could reasonably expect and we're going to start with the most certain most likely moving our way down to the least certain and as we go each subsequent breakthrough which hasn't happened yet but you might expect we're going to look at how that would affect the web design industry but we're also going to look at uh, how that might uh, disrupt us all, right, in different ways, right, from where we are right now. And my my thesis would be essentially that some, if not all of these, will occur with varying levels of certainty. So let's let's take a look at what could happen. So the first thing, the most boring and predictable thing, is speed. Things are going to get faster, right? So anyone who's worked with computers for 10, 20, whatever years will tell you computers used to be really, really slow at stuff, but they are now really, really fast at. For example, you're probably all too young to remember, but Google once upon a time used to take a few seconds to reply to a search. And now you can type into a search box in Google and as fast as you can type, Google will Google. So it's literally autocomplete fast. You're gonna see the exact same thing with AI. So right now that image on the right-hand side was predictably was created with AI and it took about 30 seconds for Midjourney. Uh, no, it wasn't Midjourney, sorry, that was Dali to create that image, right? Um, I want you to imagine that that goes from 30 seconds to three seconds, and then from three seconds to 0 0.3 seconds, and then 0, 0.0, 0, whatever seconds, doesn't matter, right? So quick that as you type, the AI is generating the art in real time. 
That is basically inevitable. Seems crazy, but it's about the most predictable thing because computers just consistently get faster and faster and faster, and we get better at writing algorithms and technology and so on. So AI is just going to keep catapulting forward. So the most boring and banal prediction is that you will be able to have AI generating things as fast as you can describe them. And that in itself doesn't sound, all right, it's nice. Why does it matter? Well, it's because it transforms everything else. So once AI is fast, it can fix a whole load of other problems. Let's take a look at the next one, accuracy. So accuracy is a, a common problem with, say, these image generators, and to some extent with things like uh, ChatGPT or text generators or video generators or whatever. You ask, ask something, and it doesn't necessarily give you exactly what you asked for. I mean, it's trying, but it, it doesn't quite get there. Now, this is a hard problem to solve for lots of reasons, but it turns out um, speed gets you a lot of the way there. If you ask for an image and you don't get the image you want right now, what you generally do is you try it again. Maybe you try it again with a slightly different prompt, but you try it again. Um, but if AI is fast enough, AI can try again for you. And it can try again maybe a thousand times in a second. And then another AI that's also super, super fast can check all those thousand versions and it can figure out which ones actually gave you what you wanted, figure out the best one and give it back to you. And if that sounds wild, we're already doing it. Uh, we already do a version of that right now. When you ask for an image from most things like Midjourney, it's actually doing multiple images and it's killing off the ones that it thinks are not that great but we could just get better and faster at that process to the point where what you type in is pretty consistently what you get. So I would say that speed and accuracy are the two most likely, uh, almost inevitable advances in all the AIs that you're experiencing so far. Then we get slightly less uh, easy, slightly more speculative. So consistency. So at the moment, present day AI technology is very deliberately what we call stateless, which is to say you ask for something and it deals with it, and then it forgets everything you told it immediately. And it's not affected by what you did in the past. I know there are applications where there's chat and so on, and they kind of cheat by feeding in the history of the conversation into the next thing you say. But basically, if I ask for something like this image here on the right, and then I say, hey, can you turn his head to the left? Can't do it. If I ask for a design uh, of a logo, and it gives me a great logo, and then I'm like, yeah, let's put that logo in this poster, it can't do it. There's no consistency to its understanding of the broader world. It's, um, we have an ability to try and do that, but it's, to use annoying technical jargon, kind of reduced dimensionality. It's like, imagine if I showed you the Pepsi Cola logo and I said, right, look at this logo now, hide, hide the can, hide the logo, do me a poster of that logo. And you can't look at the logo. You'd kind of remember the gist of it, but you wouldn't get it right. AI is a little bit like that. What we need to do is be able to give it access to look at the logo or whatever it is in front of it while it works. We don't have that technology just yet, but we're gonna probably. And when we do, it's gonna make these tools vastly, vastly more useful. Next up and related is iterative. So iterative is uh, the superpower that humans have uh, developed, but probably the most transformative technology that humans ever, ever developed. And I know fire is definitely up there, wheel is great, whatever, but it's writing. Um, and I'll explain to you why, because it's not obvious. So when, when you say, imagine I ask someone here to write a short story or a college essay or something like that. Um, what you do is you write it onto a piece of paper and you look at what you're doing and you think about it and you edit it and so on and so on and so on. And you, or you write on a word processor or whatever, right? There's a process where you take what's in your head and you dump it down in front of you so you can reflect on it and inspect it. Now, AI is not doing that doesn't have that ability yet. Um, AI is doing the equivalent of you speaking off the top of your head at all times. So intellectually, when you ask GPT, for example, to write an essay, and it does a pretty good job, it's doing the same kind of mental work in a way as you would be doing if you had to make an essay up off the top of your head and you couldn't stop and you couldn't pause and you couldn't write it down. You just had to speak the whole thing out in one go. So it's pretty amazingly good considering it's doing that. It's the same with image generation uh, in a different way. So considering that, it's remarkable. Now imagine how much better humans got when we got the ability to write things down and look at what we'd said and then reflect on it and improve it. And also to work on each other's writing and so on, right? Um, this is the difference between like an oratory tradition that has like a couple of stories and then like what we have now, a modern civilization with books and literature and so on. So AI has not gone through that revolution yet. It's going to, almost certainly. And when it does, 
that's going to transform the potential output and capacity and capability of AI. So that's a remarkable revolution to, uh, to expect at some point. And as we proceed now, we're getting into somewhat more speculative territory. So, so this is where it gets harder and uh, each subsequent wave is going to get uh, both less likely and more disruptive uh, at the same time. So the next one would be autonomy. Um, developing the ability for AI to direct its own ability to behave independently to achieve high level goals. So you'll notice that if you use any of these AI tools, they generally fire and forget. You'll type in something and it'll do it and then you're done or you will you know you'll make a a, a request and it can only operate you know the very narrow frame of solving that one thing at that moment in time but of course humans are not like this right you can go to a human and you can say hey i want you to create a brand campaign right and the brand campaign may involve coming up with ideas and doing research and then creating some of those and then testing them and then taking feedback and iterating and doing that 10 times, and then taking the end result to their boss and saying, hey, what do you think of this? AI can't do that yet, but potentially it will. And when it does, we go from a world where we say to a tool, hey, can you do me a design? To you say to a tool, hey, here's my brief, what I want to accomplish are these goals, you know, selling more uh, indoor plants or whatever. And it will figure out the most efficient ways to do that and present them to you at the end. That would be a remarkable transformation. Next up, and perhaps more surprising, would be taste. So we actually have some advances in this area already. I mentioned this before. Um, Midjourney and uh, Dali, which is what drew this actually quite beautiful image here on the right, um, have internal models of human taste. But they're quite basic. Um, essentially, AI has tried to learn what humans like to look at. Um, and it's fairly good at it. It uses that information to create art that we find appealing. But it's also quite basic, um, quite derivative, quite vanilla in a way, which may be one of the reasons why uh, AI tools have yet to produce some magnificent new piece of art that kind of transcends the genre. They tend to create stuff that looks a lot like the things we see every day. But still, developing the ability for computers to reliably model human taste could self-direct AI to higher quality outputs. So imagine if when you're asking GPT to write you a blog post, if it has a really, really good understanding of human taste, if it could do, if, um, potentially things like the emotional states, like, you know, desire or um, uh, intrigue, curiosity, et cetera, understanding and modeling those emotional states effectively would enable AI to potentially produce absolutely dynamite copy. What it's doing right now is mostly imitating the style of copy that it sees in the wild, right? So it knows how to write a slogan because it knows what slogans look like. But what it doesn't know is how to model a human psychology so effectively that it could kind of get inside their head and do something that might surprise or delight them. That again could unlock a whole new world of incredible creative potential outputs. And then lastly, and most speculatively would be brilliance. So this is definitely not, uh, well, this, this would be the most controversial among AI researchers. So. At the moment, generative AI works on a principle that we teach AI through an enormous array of examples, uh, what the real world looks like, and then it kind of figures out an internal model for creating its own stuff. And so essentially, in a way, they're kind of uh, imitating styles, right? You can give ChatGPT the prompt to write something in the style of Shakespeare, and it will do it, and it will do a surprisingly good job. It will imitate Shakespeare. But what it won't do is it won't write as well as Shakespeare. It will get his style. It will imitate his style like I might imitate his style. I'll use old words and I'll use you know certain iambic pentameters or whatever. Great. But it won't be Shakespeare. It won't be brilliant. Um, and it seems that at least so far, whatever we feed into these systems, it learns how to imitate. But it doesn't learn how to transcend. Right. There's no kind of spark of genius, of, of true spectacular creativity. And so it remains to be seen whether or not that will ever change. Um, if it does, of course, we have the potential that AI may in fact transcend what humans can do, or at least transcend what the vast majority of us could do. That would be immeasurably disruptive in ways that honestly, I scarce even try to imagine. But it's also by far and away the least likely to occur, certainly for some time in the near future. So let's put all of that together. So this model 
fast, accurate, consistent, iterative, autonomous, tasteful, and brilliant. These are what I would kind of pose are almost the, uh, the breakthroughs you can anticipate. And where we end up is going to pretty much depend on, um, oh, sorry, the disruption effects of AI are going to pretty much result, uh, <laughs> the disruption of AI is pretty much going to come down to where we land in these individual steps. So we asked the question earlier on, how much web design will AI do for us? Well, the answer is largely where we end up in this chart. If we're in the top four, AI is pretty much going to be totally subservient to us. It's going to do exactly what it's told. And that's going to be incredibly easy for us to work with and to add value. If we're in the middle, it's going to be doing some level of self-direction. So you might imagine products like, uh, say, um, automated A-B testing, where an AI looks at your website, comes up with A-B tests, runs them, and automatically improves your website. That seems very, very feasible. And ultimately, if you end up at the very bottom, if you end up at the end in brilliance, well, honestly, that's a challenge to what it means to be human. But it's also not something I would be expecting any time in the next 25 minutes, at least. So as we come to the end, uh, ending a presentation on AI job disruption with a memorable and impactful line is crucial. ChatGPT has some thoughts, and it suggests we should say um, AI is not the end of jobs, but the beginning of a new way of working. So uh, good job, GPT. AI is not the end of jobs, but the beginning of a new way of working. Um, I actually like this visual image here as well, because it kind of shows what I suspect is our likely future. Not that they're all dressed up in Iron Man costumes, but the idea that we ultimately, as with all technology, are somewhat transformed by it. Uh, think how the smartphone has uh, almost become an extension of our reality, right? Your, your intelligence, your, your brilliance, whatever, is now extended by the presence of technology you hold in your hand. And I suspect AI will do something similar and even more disruptive to us over the coming years. But um, yes, Whichever way it goes, it's going to be a wild and exciting new future. Unfortunately, at this exact moment, OpenAI chose to go down. This is actually a true story. Uh, AI then uh, crashed and uh, prevented me from doing any additional work on this presentation. So as a result, I'm going to wrap here. But uh, thank you for listening, guys. I'm going to move on now to Q&A. My name was Oliver Emberton. You can follow me on LinkedIn. And if you're interested in our AI solutions, you should take a look at simple.com forward slash AI. Jess, are you there? Hi, everyone. There's been a lot of discussion going on in the question and answer section. Oh, good. Um, to, to cover one thing just briefly, uh, we, we did record this session. Uh, we will be sending it out later in the week to everyone who was signed up for the webinar. So if you missed the beginning, uh, don't worry. You'll be able to watch it. And I believe Oliver mentioned it's probably going to go on YouTube, too. That's right. Uh, so some of the questions we've been getting, Dean Brady asked, is this going to create just more of the same look and feel? Can we assume it's going to just make more vanilla site designs? Um, actually, I would go the other way. So I'm old enough at web design. So I, I was doing web design ha -ha, when I was 16, and that was back in 1995. Um, I was doing web design when it was more creative than it is now. So modern day web design has become very derivative and predictable, I would say. Most websites look the same as each other nowadays. Um, AI actually gives you new superpowers. So let me give you an example, right? So this is, I'm literally just gonna go random here. Um, say you decided that you thought the best way to represent your brand, uh, say you sell honey. Okay, you sell honey, I'm making this up, right? Literally I'm doing it off the top of my head. You sell honey and you go, you know what I'm gonna want? I'm gonna want people dressed up as bumblebees in funny costumes, okay? I just decide I wanna do that. Now, if you're a traditional web designer, good luck, because you don't have the multi hundred thousand dollar budget required to then go and get a bunch of models and do all of the photo shoots and then just try all of that stuff and maybe make videos and trailers and whatever try all that stuff just to test it just to go oh shoot that actually sucks it doesn't work at all but what's probably going to happen in the coming you know months and years is you will just type that in in fact you could do some of it now you could just say all right i want to try that and try an entire array of wild exciting new concepts that previously would have been outside your reach I think one of the reasons web design looks so derivative now is because it's reduced around our tool chain. It's reduced around the idea of how can I quickly produce an efficient website that you know has minimal typography, has these three column layouts with the icon with the text underneath, and all the things, all the cliches that you take for granted in web design right now, that's because they're easy to do. But when they're not easy to do, 
uh, oh, sorry, when, when new exciting things become easy to do, maybe we get more variety. I'm actually quite excited. I think it could be a new golden age. Okay, because AI imagery is learned from other imagery, mm. like actual mm. artists' work, how do you reconcile mm -hmm. the copyright and ownership issue with AI imagery? I believe there are lawsuits ongoing in the US. Correct. Okay, so uh, this is a complex topic. I'm going to do my best to distill it grossly. Um, okay, so firstly, uh, all the major tools that are doing this are aware of potential or actual legal uh, jeopardy to them. You'll notice that they've all, uh, I think, all created some kind of legal insulation for their users. So, for example, uh, OpenAI has actually said, if you're sued, we will cover you, basically. Same problem. Um, it is likely there will be some legal fallout for some of the large providers that are doing this. That is seemingly inevitable. Um, but it is also uh, already something that they have taken enormous steps towards eliminating. So, for example, you may not know this, but like AI, uh, OpenAI has tried to eliminate modern art or potentially copyrights so art from their training data entirely. So they don't even have the ability to learn from it. And they've got a whole range of prompts. Like if you ask for certain protected things, they're definitely going to try and stop you and so on. Now, that's imperfect. But one of the things it revealed is even if you don't use that training data, AI can learn to be really, really good at art regardless. Like with the art that you don't have to track, like the copyright free stuff or the stuff that's, you know, old or just like looking at the universe or whatever, it turns out AI can do an incredibly good job of learning things. And so I think the progress is inevitable. There's probably going to be some legal uh, speed bumps, but I expect that there's no, you're not going back basically. Um, the best way also, I actually know the mechanics of how the AI works and I don't want to get into the math or anything, but the, um, the underlying principle is best thought of as if you were a human being and you ran around the world and you saw things with your eyes in your experience and then you drew something that was based on your life experience, you would not expect it to be copyrighted. Now, there are very specific examples where AI is not doing that, but the underlying framework and why it's good at most things is because of that. And so I don't expect you need it to be... Um, I think we'll transcend this problem, basically. I think it, it will be a non-problem eventually. Um, I'm going to skip around a bit because there's a few more comments in this vein. <laughs> um, sure. okay. If I use the tools to design something, who owns the intellectual property? Ah, well, that's country specific. Oddly enough, America has a very specific law, as I seem to recall, um, which basically implies that because a non-person created the, say, uh generated art or whatever um there's no copyright held uh which is interesting it like owns it's owned by the commons this is probably all going to be uh challenged in the coming years because it's going to become so ubiquitous it's absurd um if i was to take a copyright free image or sound or whatever right and then create some derivative work from it i would own the copyright for that so imagine you go outside and you take a photo of some i don't know grass or something um and actually create like some piece of art from that um the uh you didn't need ownership of the grass to do it i i think um uh, to, to protect the end result i think you're going to see a similar model with ai but yeah it's probably at least for the moment going to end up being copyright free and it's just the fact that no one else can replicate it it gives you some kind of protection so when using the ai to generate logos like you were doing for bloom mm -hmm. are yeah. they always going to be original work so that's really a kind of tricky concept is what you mean by original work. Like I can create logos that I think are original work. And then it turns out I subconsciously was inspired by whatever, you know, I did a shape that I saw when I was six or something, right? AI is the same. Um, for what it's worth right now, I would not use AI to do logo design. I would use AI to help assist ideate for logo design. So it's like um anyone who's actually done this will know that when, <laughs> i've done this far too many times when you when you try and create a logo uh just by sketching on a piece of paper you'll do loads of ideas and you'll be amazed how many later on if you do a copyright search or a trademark search turn out to be at least slightly similar to something that existed you might find yourself subconsciously copying a thing you've seen 400 times in the real world and you just don't even realize right it's a, it's a hard problem ai is going to have the same challenge that a human does there um, but that's where normally the way you solve that as a human is you make sure you push the boundaries on like what you're doing with it. So you're like, okay, I'm not just going to go like a leaf 
as my logo because if I just do a leaf as my logo, it's too obvious, right? But if I do a leaf growing out of the word bloom, maybe inside the O, maybe it's a bit more creative. And if I do like the word bloom written in an unusual font, then it's more creative and so on. So like just pushing the like the number of dimensions out that make it improbable it would happen by accident is normally the way most logo designers approach that. And I think it's the same with AI. So if you ask for like a generic, give me a logo for the letter M, don't be surprised if it looks like it's going to violate McDonald's or something by accident, because there's only so many ways of doing it. But if you ask for the letter M written inside a seashell in a unusual color palette, then you're probably more okay. So it's, it's again, same as it is for humans. Does the AI create sites and content that meet WCAG AA standards? Uh, at the moment, there are various tools, which I didn't actually demonstrate here, that attempt to build websites using AI. Uh, so there's various site builders, Wix and so on have a number. It's generally the free site builders. Um, it would depend on the individual platform, but it's not actually specific to the AI in this case. They're usually, uh, they're usually using AI to generate um based on a mixture of templates and some kind of it, it, it's a complicated topic but i would normally expect no but there's no reason why they couldn't make that happen in the theory to a point so they could get like the code like the buttons or whatever could be accessible the links could be accessible the bit that the ai would not currently have the understanding of is things like is this fully intelligible by a user for example um you know, uh, is the navigation consistent? That kind of thing. Those areas currently AI can't solve. But uh, for a se separate webinar, you can probably predict we are going to do an AI uh, accessibility webinar and they will talk about this in a lot more detail. Uh, right. Copyright law. Uh, have you ever used ChatGPT to uh, look at the accessibility? of like the WCAG for any code analysis? Yes. Yeah, so um, again, I'm definitely going to do a webinar on this because it's it's literally easily an hour without even trying. Um, there's lots of interesting pioneering attempts to apply accessibility, uh, sorry, to apply AI to accessibility. Um, the standard answer that ordinarily applies is AI cannot do this. The reality is now that it's changing a little. It's not fully changed, but it's definitely changing. And I have some quite nuanced and elaborate thoughts on the subject, which I will fully explain. I'm actually talking about that at CSUN with you, Jess, as it turns out, um, as you know. So uh, anyone who's coming to CSUN, you can meet me there and we'll be uh, elaborating on that. But we were also going to do a webinar or two on the topic because uh, I think it's particularly imp important to our industry. Um, right now, though, at least AI can't. But yeah, AI is doing a lot of things that once upon a time it couldn't. So we will see. Okay, uh, next up. I see a lot of value in referencing heat map data generated by AI during the design process. And I'm actively mm -hmm. using Attention Insight as part of my practice. Do you see a future oh, where cool. specific heat mapping and analytics data collected by Soaktide could be fed into a tool like Attention Insight? So that the AI generated heat maps are based on specific websites, users past interactions versus heat maps based on general web users. So that's pretty cool. I haven't seen that specific future, I'll be honest. That's pretty uh, niche. However, I will say that generally I expect AIs to learn to interface with each other relatively early. So this is one of my, I don't have enough time to do this AI talk talks, but um Essentially, you know how we now take it for granted. There was software, people invented software and put it on the internet. And then the next thing that almost happened pretty soon afterwards was APIs, right? So we got software and then we got APIs that software could talk to software because it's so valuable. I expect, we're early stage of AI, I expect the same. I expect integration of AIs is inevitable. And I've actually got <laughs> some detailed thoughts on how, but, um, but the idea would be, imagine that your GPT can talk to your Google Analytics, can talk to your Silk Tide, can talk to your whatever, right? All of those things being pulled together and then being able to interface intelligently and autonomously towards specific goals. So yeah, I actually imagine that things like what you described will actually emerge and they may not even require programming. They may actually be uh, uh, adaptive and um, literally self-integrating would be the, the, the dream. But we're a ways out from that just yet. There's a couple questions about how the Silk Tide AI works, uh, how it was mm -hmm. trained, what tool is underpinning the Silk Tide AI. Sure. 
Uh, we're using uh, GPT-4 uh, as the underlying uh, substrate. Um, we didn't need to train it uh, in the conventional sense. I think people typically think of that as something like reinforcement learning or whatever, but it, it doesn't work like that. Um, essentially, we have our own quite uh, sizable database that we've curated of uh, user experience, advice, knowledge, et cetera, that we feed into that. And then we combine it with an internal model we generate of the web page that represents it in a kind of semantic and visual uh, way that it's able to interpret. Um, that's a simplified version. Uh, the real version is a entire tech talk, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's proprietary, but leveraging open AI. Can Silk Tide AI compare two different designs like AB testing? Uh, no, that's actually really cool. Let me write that down. I know, uh, right? Thank you for that idea. Thank uh, you, Wilkie. <laughs> Um, no, so I will say um, just high level, I'm not going to, we've got a lot of stuff that we're working on in the AI space. And um, speaking as CEO, I believe this is, as you probably got from my talk, uh, incredibly transformative and the potential for new tools and services and products and features is like nothing we've ever experienced in the history of computing. And I think there's going to be an explosion of things that uh, software can do. And I certainly expect Siltai to do a lot of them. But uh, I won't. I won't give out too many details just yet. But there's definitely a lot we're working on right now. Um, will this be a feature of the Silk Tide Chrome extension? Aha! Uh -huh. uh, I'd have to think about that. So let's see. So the main challenge with doing it in a Chrome extension would be it does cost us money, um, and of course the Chrome extension is free. Um, so if you imagine we have a hundred thousand users on a Chrome extension, that might be challenging. Um, so yeah, I suspect, I suspect not, but we are doing a version of the Chrome extension for paid customers uh, who would already have access to our AI. And for those customers, I definitely think that makes sense. So yeah, I think that can be, uh, can be right back. And because I'm totally going to read all of the questions, how do you justify the enormous negative environment impact AI has? Oh, okay. Well, that's a spicy one. Um, I'm assuming, so I'm going to have to interpret that question as uh, the consumption of energy, I assume. Uh, as in, we're talking like environmental harm to, um, like through carbon emissions, et cetera. I'm assuming that's the intent of the question. Um, so I'm not an expert on this, to be fair. Um, I will say um, the way that AI actually operates at the moment um, it's actually relatively energy efficient to run it compared to, okay, so sorry, let me give you an example. Um, something I know about uh, hydrodynamic uh, fluid simulations, sorry, niche topic. But if you're trying to simulate something that uses a lot of computing power, right? So fluids, if you've, have you ever seen a computer simulate a fluid like in CGI or in a video game or whatever, where it like, uh, you know, you put water in a container and it sloshes around. It's very realistic, right? So that's one of the most computer intensive things you can get a computer to do. It's very, very difficult to simulate all the particles and the interactions and so on. Now, um, it turns out that we can do it with AI with something like 0.5% of computing power. Um, you train an AI to understand more or less the same principles, but it's kind of simulating them like your brain would simulate them. So it's kind of not quite as accurate, but it's got the themes and the styles and it understands what's significant and it's massively massively more efficient um our brains are incredibly power efficient relative to the output your brain is drawing a lot less electricity than your iphone is right it's nuts and yet um you know think how much more it does right so actually it turns out the the substrate of uh, of modern ai like the kind of processing neural nets and so on is actually fundamentally very efficient at doing things now where it's not efficient which is possibly what you're hearing is where you're training it. So when you're training the AI and you need to give it a hundred billion trillion web pages and feed that in and build the model, that does use energy. That's definitely true. And you need a lot, a lot of chips and GPUs and stuff like that. It's very expensive. That's like billions in cost. So you're not wrong about that. The consumption of the said intelligence once it's built on the other hand can literally run on your phone. So I think to some extent, the answer to this question is gonna come down to the asymmetry in those, those two components. Uh, we're definitely going to make the, uh, the training more efficient over time, but then we're also going to probably want more training. It's pretty hard to say. 
I don't, I don't, um, I don't think you're going back from here. Um, I think the the value of AI is already deployed everywhere anyway. Um, it's profound. I think there's a legitimate case. Obviously, we need to be concerned. We need to be tracking the environmental impact. But um, I don't think you can undo it. I think what you need to do is figure out what's the best way to use what we have to make it energy efficient. And there's a lot of people very interested in working on that problem because, quite frankly, everyone wants to train AI right now. And they're all looking at ways they can do it with less resources because no one can afford 100,000 NVIDIA GPUs unless they're like Facebook or something. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think it'll get better. But, yeah, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Have you seen the rabbit device that was shown at CES? Mm -hmm. I have, yes. It's kind of okay, funny. Okay, good. It says, um, uh, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? their approach to AI and its possibility with accessibility, specifically the language action models? Okay, so... Uh, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing and also for anyone who doesn't know what this is, uh, it's like a, a wearable device that essentially gives AI uh, awareness. So it's like, a, it's got like a camera and sensors and things and it kind of, you have a voice interface to talk to it. Am I correct? It's the same thing we're talking about, right? Yeah, okay, cool. So imagine like uh, almost like a mobile phone or a post mobile phone, a device that you wear that has awareness of where you're at and you can ask it questions and it can you know, look around you and it can say things. Uh, so you could say stuff like, you know, what am I looking at right now? And if you were blind or partially sighted, it could potentially help you with that. So um, yeah, this kind of technology and stuff like this is why I want to talk about at CSUN. The transformational potential for accessibility in AI is absolutely off the scale, right? Um, the thing to think of with AI is you are literally creating a digital intelligence, potentially close to human level. So what the heck is it worth to have a portable human that you could wear on your lapel that can help you tirelessly with every possible task? That's insane, right? And so, yeah, I think uh, we are probably going to see every single aspect of accessibility reinvented within 10 years, every single one, completely. Fundamental grounds up the whole thing. Um, because we've gone from a world where the only solutions were things that were quite uh, quite primitive technically to a point where maybe AI can literally make sense of the world around you and communicate to you in natural language without you needing to learn difficult technology like screen readers. So yeah, it's going to be uh, a wild time to be like. That's exactly where Dean was going with this. He's followed up to say less okay. about the wearable part, but its ability to interact with interfaces. That's the special power. Right, okay. Um, so I'm less familiar on that specific detail, so I don't want to talk outside of my area. But um, broadly, I think we are going to go through a golden age of uh, advances in the accessibility space, and it's literally going to kick off this year. Uh, someone asked if where they can find the Improve UX tool. Uh, they said okay, so they've it's, been looking it's, at our it's, website it's... and they don't see it. <laughs> Yeah, it's not live yet. Uh, I literally have to come off this webinar and then in a couple of hours. Um, but it is actually mentioned. It's on siltoy.com slash AI. And in the top right corner, there is a navigation option. I think it's called Improve UX. I believe that page is live. But the the tool itself will be updated in uh, in a couple of hours. Right. That's the questions. There's a lot of really nice comments okay. in here. <laughs> Okay, good to hear. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. Um, thank you, Jess, for taking the time. Uh, and um, thank you, everyone, for attending. There will be a, another webinar like this on AI and accessibility in the near future. We'll, uh, we'll keep you posted on that one. There'll be many more besides. We're going to be doing a whole series of AI webinars in the web space. So if you found this interesting, please do stay tuned. And I hope to see you again next time. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.